Today we're going to talk about complex numbers, what they are, how we use them, and what we can do with them. So the motivation for complex numbers arises from the following problem. As we work through uh, various, uh, various problems and questions in mathematics and physics and so forth, occasionally re we run into equations like the following. We run into equations like x squared equals negative 4. And we want to find a value of x that makes this equation true. But the problem is there is no real number that does this. If I take any real number and square it, I'm either going to get a positive number or zero. Because if I take a positive number and square it, I get a positive number. If I take zero and square it, I get zero. And if I take a negative number and square it, that's going to give me a positive number because a negative times a negative is a positive. And so there's no real number that you can plug into this equation, x squared equals negative 4, to make it true. So this equation has no real number solutions. And that's pretty disappointing. Uh, when you're trying to work through a problem, you run into something like this and you have to stop and say, well, I guess we can't do anything with this now. Similarly, uh, for uh, very similar reasons, occasionally we want to get to the point where we'd like to factor something like x squared plus 9. And we can't do this. This doesn't factor. Uh, in the real numbers. That is if we restrict ourselves to only looking at polynomials with real coefficients. Now if this were x squared minus 9 we would know how to factor that. That's a difference of two squares and we've even got a formula for how to factor a difference of two squares but we don't have a formula for factoring a sum of two squares. And what this shows from a more abstract point of view is that the real numbers are insufficient. They don't do everything that we would like from a mathematical point of view. And it's not just the theory side of things. Uh, we run into these kinds of equations when we're working with things like uh, electrical engineering and, uh, and understanding alternate current, uh, alternating current and so forth. There are lots of places, even in the real world, where we run into equations like this where we really think there should be some way of describing uh, an answer to this. And so, uh, to do this, we are going to introduce uh, a new symbol. It's going to be the imaginary unit. The imaginary unit, which we will denote by a lowercase i. And we're going to define it by its properties. This has the property that i squared equals negative 1. So intuitively, i, we can, we can think of i as being the square root of negative 1. This is slightly imprecise because the square root of negative 1 isn't, uh, isn't properly defined, but this is the intuition behind what's going on. Now we know that i is not a real number for exactly the reasons we said before. There are no real numbers that have a square of negative 1. And so we're going to introduce this new symbol i and it's going to have the property that i squared is negative 1. It's going to fill in the gap that real numbers have. And uh, we're going to use it to define a new class of numbers that we can work with. Now, I should mention that uh, the terminology for the imaginary unit is really kind of poor. The imaginary unit i is no more or less imaginary than any other number. It's no more imaginary than, say, negative 7 or 4. It's a little harder to wrap your mind around immediately. It's a little bit less intuitive, but from a mathematical point of view, there's no reason to prefer uh, 
a number like 7 over a number like i. So we call them imaginary, but we shouldn't take that to mean that they are any less important or any less um, valid to mathematics as a whole. So it's uh, just a term that has been kept for many, many years, so it's not going away, but uh, I just wanted to point out that it's not really the best one. So we're going to use this symbol i to describe, um, say, square roots of negative numbers, which we can't normally uh, describe. So, for example, a way we do that is the following. We can write the square root of negative 25 in terms of i. And we can, write, and we can do that in the following way. We can write the square root of negative 25 as the square root of 1 times, sorry, square root of negative 1 times the square root of 5. Now the square root of negative 1, that we are going to replace with i. And then the square root of 25, of course, we can write down as just 5. And so we get i times 5, or so we sometimes write it 5 times i. Order of multiplication doesn't matter here, so the i can come either before or after uh, the other numbers. We'll usually write it afterwards. So the square root of negative 25 is not a real number, but we can express it in a meaningful way as 5i. And we can do this again with one more example. Let me look at the square root of negative 98. That'd be the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 98. Now the square root of negative 1 is just i. The square root of 98 we can simplify a bit. This, because 98 is equal to 49 times 2. The square root of 98 is equal to the square root of 49 times the square root of 2. And the square root of 49 is 7. So we get i times 7 times the square root of 2. Or we could write this a uh, number of different ways. Probably the most common way of writing it down uh, by hand would be 7 times i times the square root of 2. But you'll also see it sometimes written 7 times the square root of 2 times i. They all mean the same thing because we're just rearranging uh, items uh, that are being multiplied and that doesn't change their value. Now, once we've started defining uh, multiplication, or sorry, not multiplication, but square roots of negative numbers in this way using i here, we need to be careful. One of the rules that we've well, been using here uh, for square roots doesn't apply uh, all the time. So a warning. The formula, the square root of a times b equals the square root of a times the square root of b does not hold if a and b are both negative. If a and b are both positive, or if one's positive and one's negative, this equation can hold. But if a and b are both negative, it doesn't anymore. So for example, uh, if we look at the square root of, let's say, uh, negative 5 times negative 20. Well, on the one hand, uh, well, uh, sorry, let's compare that on the one hand to the square root of what we get when we take the square root of negative 5 times the square root of negative 20. So if we multiply inside first, we get this negative 5 times negative 20 is 100. And then the square root of 100 is just 10. On the other hand, if we take the square root of 5 times the square root of 20, that's the same thing as i times the square root of 5 
because this is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 5. And the square root of negative 20 is the square root of ne negative 1 times the square root of 20. So we get i times the square root of 20 for the second piece here. So now we've got a few pieces here. We can rearrange it. We can write this as the square root of 100 by gathering up the square root of 5 and square root of 20 together. But then we've got also two i's being written here. So we get the square root of 100 times i squared. Well, that will give us 10 for the square root of 100. But then i squared is negative 1. This is the whole definition of i squared is that it's equal to negative 1. So i squared becomes negative 1. And in particular, notice that that means that the two sides that I've written down here are not the same. So 10 does not equal 10 times negative 1, does not equal negative 10. And so the splitting up of a square root across a couple of different numbers doesn't work if those two numbers are both negative. So be careful of that, be aware of that. So uh, let's talk about what else we can do with this imaginary unit, i. We're actually going to use them to define a new class of numbers called complex numbers. A complex number is a number of the form a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers. So for example, we can take 3 plus 2 i, we could take negative 7 minus 1 half i, which is really shorthand for negative 7 plus negative 1 half i. We could take something like 4i, which is a shorthand for 0 plus 4i. So if we just have a, uh, an expression which is just a number times i, that's still a complex number. And furthermore, even a single real number, like 3, is still a complex number. So every real number is a complex number. It's just a complex number where the coefficient of the i is 0. So notice that in these last two examples, we had that this 3, which is a real number, uh, just exactly uh, became the first part of our complex number, the 3 right there. And we had a 0 on the other side. Uh, and then similarly over here, when we had just a number times i, we got, can write this as a complex number by using a zero for the real part here. So this uh, gives us another piece of terminology that we have here. When we look at a complex number like this, we're going to call the a piece right here, the part that isn't being multiplied by i, the real part of a plus b i and b is going to be the imaginary part of a plus b i. So we could say that the real part of negative 7 minus 1 half i is negative 7 and the imaginary part of negative 7 minus 1 half i is negative 1 half. So every complex number is made up of a real part and an imaginary part. And if the imaginary part is 0, then the number is actually a real number to begin with. Now, one bit of technical uh, notation that we need to be uh, 
precise, precise about, about is the following. Two complex numbers are equal if and only if their real parts are equal and their complex parts are equal. So, uh, for instance, if I have 3 plus 2i and I've got 3 minus 2i, I know that those two numbers are not equal to one another because their real parts are the same. Their real parts are both 3, but their imaginary parts are different. One has an imaginary part of 2. The other has an imaginary part of negative 2. On the other hand, if I wrote down something like 6 divided by 2 plus 2i and 3 plus 2i. Well, these are in fact equal because their real parts are equal, even though they aren't written down exactly the same way because I haven't simplified the fraction on the left. And their imaginary parts are equal also. Now, when we've got a new set of numbers that we want to think about, uh, we want to know how we add them, subtract them, multiply them, and divide them, etc. You may remember this back when you were learning uh, about new types of numbers uh, in elementary school. So first you learned about the, the natural numbers, the counting numbers, and then you learned about negative numbers, and together all of those made the integers. And then you learned about rational numbers, and then you learned about real numbers, and going up all that way, each time you had to make sure that you knew how to add two of these new types of numbers, how to subtract them, how to multiply them, how to divide them. We're going to do the same thing here. And so the good news is that adding, subtracting, and multiplying complex numbers is very straightforward. So I'm going to write it down this way, and we'll do a few examples. So adding, subtracting, and multiplying complex numbers works by treating i as if it were a variable. We'll see what that means in a second. Then using the fact that i squared equals negative 1. So for example, let's say that we had 3 minus 5i, and we wanted to add to that 1 plus 2i. Well, what we want to do at this point is imagine what we would do if that i had no meaning other than just being a symbol, just being a variable. And if that were the case, what we would do is we would look at these two expressions. Um, we would say, all right, well, where are the like terms? And we would add the like terms together. So we would see that, for instance, we've got like terms of 3 and 1. We've got, those are both constant terms. And adding them together will give us a 4. And then we've got like terms of the negative 5i and 2i. So those are both like terms because they both have an i in them. And if we add negative 5i plus 2i, just like when we're working with fractions, uh, sorry, with variables, we just add the coefficients together. So the first one has a coefficient of negative 5, the second has a coefficient of 2. We add those together and we get negative 3i. Which, you'll notice, is another complex number. If you add together two complex numbers, you get another 
complex number. So adding complex numbers is just this simple. You add the real parts together, you add the imaginary parts together, and you're basically done. And the same is true for uh, working with subtraction, except there, of course, you have to be a little bit more careful because you have to distribute the negative through. So when I'm subtracting these things, the first thing that I'll do is I will rewrite it, but distribute the negative in front of the second term through. So negative 4 minus i will be negative 4, and then negative times negative uh, 1 is positive. So remember that when you've got a minus in front of the i in front of anything, that's treated as an invisible negative 1, similarly over here. So we're taking an invisible negative 1 and multiplying it by 4, taking an, taking an invisible negative 1 and multiplying it by the invisible negative 1 that's sitting in front of the i. So we wind up getting plus i out of this. And now we can add all these terms together just like we did in the first example by combining like terms. A 1 and a negative 4 combine to give us a negative 3. And then a 2 plus i gives us plus 3i. So that's how we subtract two complex numbers. Multiplying complex numbers works similarly. Uh, we just have one more step to do. So let's look at uh, 2 plus 2i times 3 plus 4i. Let's multiply these two together. Well, we're going to, again, treat this as if this were just a product of two expressions involving variables. And we know that when we do that, we have to distribute everything or FOIL everything out. So we're going to need to multiply each term in the first expression by each term in the second expression and see what we get. So 2 times 3 is going to be 6. 2 times 4i is going to work just as if i was a variable. So if we take 2 times 4i, that would give us 8i. We would multiply the coefficients together. Now inner, 2i times 3 is 6i. And then finally, 2i times 4i is going to be 8i squared. So in this last term where 2i and 4i are multiplying, the coefficients multiply together. 2 times 4 is 8. And then the, uh, the i terms multiply together. What would be the variable terms if this were a true variable? Uh, i times i gives you i squared. Now what makes this different from if this were just involving a variable is that we know what i squared is i squared is equal to negative 1. So in the next step, we want to rewrite this again, only we want to replace i with negative 1. I'm sorry, i squared with negative 1. So in this case, we wind up with constant terms, uh, or real terms, of 6 and negative 8 and the sum of those two is negative 2. And then imaginary parts of 8i plus 6i, which gives us plus 14i. So that's how we multiply complex numbers together. We distribute it out, foil it out as if they were polynomials, and then change the i squared back into a negative 1 before we simplify everything back down together. And so we see from this that adding, subtracting, or multiplying any two complex numbers gives you another complex number. Now we can also divide two complex numbers together to get a complex number, but to do that we need one more bit of terminology and uh, one, uh, one special step that we use in this case. So we need the following terminology. 
the complex conjugate of the complex number a plus bi is the number a minus bi. So if I have a complex, if I have a complex number, a plus bi, then the complex conjugate of that number is that same number, but I'm going to switch the inside, uh, I'm going to switch b to negative b. I'm going to change the sign of the imaginary part. So for example, the conjugate or complex conjugate of uh, 3 minus 2i is 3 plus 2i. And vice versa. Uh, taking the conjugate twice just gets you back where you started. So the conjugate of the conjugate is the original. Uh, just for a couple more examples, the conjugate of 6i is negative 6i. Because remember that when uh, when the real part isn't written, it's an imaginary 0. So we still have to change the sign of the, of the imaginary part in order to get the conjugate. Now let's think about what's the conjugate of 4. Well, 4 has an invisible 4 plus 0i after it. And so the conjugate of it would be 4 minus 0i, which is just 4. So the conjugate of 4 is, in fact, just 4. The conjugate of a real number is itself. The main property of conjugates that we care about is the following. The product of a complex number and its conjugate is a real number. Let's see a couple of examples to convince ourselves that that's going to be the case. So if I take 3 minus 2i and I multiply that by 3 plus 2i, let's see what we get. We get 3 times 3 is 9. Then 3 times 2i gives us 6i. Then negative 2i times 3 is negative 6i. And then negative 2i times 2i will give us negative 4 i squared. So in particular, notice that the two i terms in the middle, the two imaginary terms in the middle, cancel out. 6i and minus 6i is just 0. So when we simplify this, we're going to get 9 minus 4. But then furthermore, we're going to replace our i squared with negative 1. So in fact, we just get 9 plus 4, which is just going to be 13. Now, you'll notice that there was nothing special about 3 or 2 in this problem that, uh, that we worked. And the same sort of pattern would emerge no matter what complex number and its conjugate that I worked with. So a fact that we're going to use uh, reasonably often is the following. If I take a complex number and I multiply it by its conjugate, that's going to give me the square of the, uh, the, square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part, always. And that's just by following the same pattern that we saw in the example above. So if I take any complex number, multiply it by its conjugate, I'm always going to get a real number. And furthermore, I know exactly what that real number is going to be. It's going to be 
the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. So conjugates are sort of special, and multiplying by a conjugate uh, does very nice things for us. It's, it occasionally uh, almost works like magic how well it works. So let's see how we're going to use this to divide things. So dividing complex numbers. Let's say that we've got 2 plus... 4i divided by 5 plus 6i. What we're going to do is use a technique that um, will change the form of this fraction without actually changing its value. You'll remember from when you learned how to just add or subtract fractions together that once you found the least common denominator, what you wanted to do is to multiply a fraction on the top and the bottom by the same thing in order to get it to have the denominator that you wanted. Well, we're going to do that here, only instead of trying to find a least common denominator, we're going to try to get the denominator to be a real number rather than a complex number. So the reason why this is not a uh, written in our normal complex number form is because you've got that i in the denominator. And i's in the denominator don't work well for us. They're not helpful. They're sort of like variables in the denominator. We can't, we don't like to see them there, generally. So here's the trick that we're going to use. We're going to multiply uh, the top and bottom of this fraction by the conjugate of the denominator. And the reason why we're going to do that is because this will make the, de the denominator a real number using the fact that we just had. So we take 2 plus 4i over 5 plus 6i, and what we're going to do is multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. First of all, let's make sure that we're allowed to do this. We're allowed to multiply by the same thing on the top and bottom of a fraction because 5 minus 6i, the conjugate we care about, over 5 minus 6i is just 1. And multiplying by 1 doesn't change the value of an expression. In fact, we're always allowed to multiply by 1, but sometimes we can multiply by 1 in a clever way. And that's what we're doing here. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by the same thing, namely the conjugate of the denominator. Now when we do this, the product on the bottom, we know how that works out. A complex number times its conjugate is going to be the real number that you get by adding the square of the first of the real part and the square of the imaginary part. Now on the top, we've actually got these two expressions. We're going to need to FOIL these out. We're going to need to multiply these out like we multiply together any uh, complex numbers. So we'll do that. We'll get 2 times 5 is 10. Then 2 times negative 6i is negative 12i. 4i times 5 is 20i. And then 4i times negative 6i is negative 24 i squared. Don't forget this squared. And let's continue simplifying. So on the top we've got 10. Negative 12i plus 20i is plus 8i, because negative 12 plus 20 is 8. And then we get negative 24 times negative 1, because i squared is negative 1. Now 5 squared is 25 and 6 squared is 36 so that's what we have there. And so we get in the numerator 10 plus 24 which is 34 plus 8i and in the denominator 
we have 25 plus 36, which is 50, uh, sorry, not 51, 61. So we get 34 plus 8i over 61. Now, this, is, this still isn't quite in our standard form of complex number that we use. So what we do next is we'll split up this fraction. Remember that we can always split up a fraction across the numerator. We can keep the denominator the same, but split the numerator up into all its various pieces that are being added and subtracted. And then the last step to make this look just exactly the way that we want, we'll usually write it in the following way. Instead of writing 8i over 61, we'll write it as 8 over 61 times i. Now, notice that this all means exactly the same thing. Uh, because 8 over 61 times i, uh, we can think of i as an i over 1. And so when we multiply those two fractions together, we would in fact get 8i over 61. So this is how we can divide complex numbers uh, together. So we can see that we can multiply complex numbers together, we can divide them, we can add them, we can subtract them, and so we can do uh, algebra with them. Complex numbers uh, contain the real numbers, but they're an expansion of it. And in fact, they expand in a very useful way, which we'll talk about a little bit more later when we talk about solutions to polynomials, uh, more complex types of uh, types of equations than we've looked at so far. But from an algebraic point of view, the complex numbers really are a better set of numbers to look at than the real numbers. There are more of them, and they uh, have nicer properties. There are more solutions to equations, and you can factor things more in the complex numbers than you can in just the real numbers, which is what we want. All right, there are a couple more properties of complex numbers that we want to look at and um, some terminology that we get to. So let's look at an interesting pattern that we get when we start looking at powers of the imaginary unit i itself. Let's just start raising it to powers and see what we get. Well, first of all, i to the zero width is uh, just equal to 1. And that's because any number other than 0 raised to the zero width is 1. i to the first power is, of course, just i. Any number raised to itself is its uh, any number raised to 1 is itself. i squared is equal to negative 1. That's the definition of i. Well, what about i cubed? Well, the easiest way to work out what i cubed is, is to split it up. i cubed is the same as i squared times i. And that's helpful to us because we know that i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is negative 1 times i, or the way it's usually written, just negative i. So i cubed gives us negative i. And then what about i to the fourth? There are a number of ways that we can work this out, but the simplest one is to write this as i squared times i squared. Now we know that i squared is negative 1, and i squared again is negative 1. And so negative 1 times negative 1 is just 1. So look at what we've got so far. We started with i to the zeroth, which gave us 1, and we got i, negative 1, negative i, 1. And let's see what happens when we keep going. We'll start seeing an interesting pattern. If I look at i to the fifth, well, that's going to be i to the fourth times i. But we know i to the fourth is 1. And 1 times anything is just itself. So multiplying by i to the fourth doesn't actually do anything, which means we just have i left i to the 6th, again, we can split off the i to the 4th piece, 
and get i to the fourth times i squared. And again, i to the fourth is just one, which means multiplying by it doesn't change anything. So we just have i squared. And we know from what we did above that i squared is negative one. And we can continue this. i to the seventh is i to the fourth times i cubed. And we get that i to the seventh is just the same as i cubed, which we worked out to be negative i. And then, uh, last one we'll do on, on this line here, we get i to the eighth is the same as i to the fourth times i to the fourth. Well, that's just one times one, which is just one back again. So what we see here is that we've got a cycle. As we raise i to higher and higher powers, we keep cycling through the same values. We start with one, then we get i, negative one, negative i, one, i, negative one, negative i, one. And of course, this is just going to keep continuing over and over and over again. And that's because every time we take four powers of i, we just get one. So it's like we didn't even do those at all. And so what this means for us is that um, for any n, i to the n is equal to i to the r, where r is the remainder. Uh, after dividing n by 4. So let's, let's see how that works. So if I want to find i to the 17, well, what I can do is I can think, all right, well, what's the power of four, what, or what's the multiple of four, I should say, that comes um, as early as possible before 17? And 16 is a multiple of four. So that means that i to the 17 is i to the 16, times i to the first. But i to the 16 we know is i to the fourth. To the fourth times i to the first. And we know that i to the fourth is equal to one. And so that means that one to the fourth is equal to one. All of that is just multiplying everything by one. None of that matters. And so we're just left with i. Well, i to the first power which is just i again. All right, let's do this again. Let's look at i to the 100 and, uh, sorry, 110th power. Once again, we wanna ask, all right, what's oh, the highest multiple of four that's still less than 110? We can do that uh, in the following way, we know that i to the 108th times i squared is equal to i to the 110, and 108 is a multiple of 4, which means we can write this as i to the 4th raised to, well, something. It actually doesn't matter too much. In this case, it happens to be 27 i squared. But the reason it doesn't matter is because, of course, i to the 4th is equal to 1 which means that all those powers of i, all the 108 powers of i, don't matter. They're just multiplying by one, which doesn't change the value of anything. And so we just get i squared out of that, which is equal to negative one. So this means that we can work out the power of i for any power pretty easily. We just need to know what the remainder is when you divide that power by four. And that can always give you uh, what you need simply by remembering these four values. Simply by knowing that i to the zeroth is one, i to the first is i, i squared is negative one, and i cubed is negative i.
So that's an interesting thing that we get with powers of i that we don't get with any real numbers. If you get, if you take any real number and you take higher and higher powers of it, um, then you're going to, um, if the number that you started with is bigger than one, you're just going to keep getting numbers that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you raise them to higher powers. If you start with a number less than one, you get numbers that are getting smaller and smaller down to zero. If you start with one, you just get one, 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 one back again. In fact, the only real number that exhibits behavior at all close to this is negative one. And we know that if you take negative one and raise it to a power, well, then it bounces back and forth between negative one and positive one. So you remember that negative one raised to an odd power is negative one. Negative one raised to an even power is one. And in fact, we can sort of see that pattern emerging even in this, uh, this example, because we can see the negative ones and the ones showing up again. So this is a, uh, a very interesting uh, result that we get when we look at powers of, uh, of i. One of the things that's important for us when we work with real numbers that we're going to take a long look at later, actually, is the notion of absolute value. And now we're familiar with the notion of absolute value of real numbers, but we also have an absolute value of complex numbers. The absolute value of complex numbers. Uh, so, well, we'll just start with the definition. The absolute value uh, or sometimes it's called magnitude. Of a plus bi, the complex number a plus bi, is, well, first of all, we denote it using the vertical bars, the same as we do for absolute value of real numbers. And it's defined to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, uh, one thing that you'll notice is that this a squared plus b squared uh, expression here is in fact something that we've seen before. That's what we got when we multiplied a number by its conjugate. And in fact, though we won't take advantage of this very often, uh, in this course, in other courses, it does become quite relevant that this is actually the square root of what you get when you multiply a complex number by its conjugate. We will see later on that this is also um, measuring the, uh, the distance between, between two points or even the hypotenuse of a triangle. So this a squared plus b squared you might think looks a little familiar because it looks a little like the Pythagorean theorem. And you're not wrong, and there's good reason for that, but we'll have to wait on that for a little bit. So this is the definition of the absolute value of a complex number. So uh, one thing that you'll notice is that the absolute value of a plus bi is always real, and furthermore, it's always uh, non-negative. So a squared is a real number, a non-negative real number, in fact. b squared is a non-negative real number. You add them together, you get another non-negative real number. So it's either zero or positive, which means when you take the square root, you get a zero or positive number. So the absolute value of a complex number is always a non-negative number, just like uh, for, uh, for real numbers. Also, let's think about when the absolute value of a complex number is zero. So a comp the absolute value of a complex number is zero, that happens exactly when, if and only if, the square root of a squared plus b squared 
equals zero. Well, the only number whose square root is zero is zero itself. So if the square root of a squared plus b squared is zero, that must mean that a squared plus b squared was zero to begin with. Now again, if a was positive, then a squared would be positive, and adding b squared to that would have to keep you positive because b squared has to be um, has to be positive itself. So a squared here is greater than or equal to zero. B squared here is greater than or equal to zero. And so the only way for the sum of these two numbers to be zero is if they were both zero to begin with. So this whole thing happens if and only if a squared equals zero and b squared equals zero. And that happens if and only if a is equal to zero and b is equal to zero. So the conclusion to this whole exercise, this whole train of thought, is that the only complex number with zero absolute value is zero plus zero i, that is the number zero. Let's do a couple of examples of computing absolute value. Let's find the absolute value. Of uh, 5 plus 4i. Well, the absolute value of 5 plus 4i is going to be the square root of 5 squared plus 4 squared. You just take the two numbers in your uh, in your complex number, square them, add them up, take the square root. So that's going to be the square root of 25 plus 16, which is the square root of 41. That can't actually be simplified any further. So the absolute value of 5 plus 4i is the square root of 41. So uh, let's take a couple more. Uh, find the absolute value of, of uh, let's say, uh, 2 plus 2i. So again, the solution, the absolute value of 2 plus 2i is equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 2 squared, which is the square root of 8, which we can simplify down. Uh, square root of 8 is the same as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2, which gives us 2 times the square root of 2. All right. Last one of these examples, let's find the absolute value of 3 plus 4i over 1 plus i. Now, this one we have to do a little bit of work on. If we're given a complex number that isn't in the standard form of a plus bi, then we have to put it into that form somehow. We have to do some sort of simplification, expand things out, combine things together, things like this. And if we have a division, as in this case, then we're going to have to use our trick of multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom. Uh, let, let me start down here. The first step is to turn this into standard form. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. Now here, we know that the product of a complex number and its conjugate is 
the square of the real part and the imaginary parts added together. So this is going to be 1 squared plus 1 squared. And then in the numerator, we have to FOIL things out. So we get 3 times 1 is 3. 3 times negative 1 is uh, negative i, rather, is negative 3i. 4i times 1 is 4i. And 4i times negative i is negative 4i squared. So simplifying things down, we get 3 plus a single i, so 3 plus 1i. i squared is negative 1, so negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4. Then the denominator here is 2. And so we wind up with 7 plus i over 2. Now we're not quite done. We need to write this explicitly in the form a number plus a number times i. So we write this as 7 halves plus 1 half i, where the 1 is coming from the invisible 1 that sits here in front of the i. So that means that the absolute value of 3 plus 4i over 1 plus i is the same as the absolute value of 7 halves plus one-half i. And now we can use our formula. Now we can use the formula for the absolute value. The absolute value of seven-halves plus one-half i is seven-halves squared plus one-half squared, and square root of that whole thing. So we can simplify this. This gives us 49 over 4 plus 1 over 4. 4, which gives us the square root of 50 over 4. And we can simplify this a little more. We can write this as the square root of 50 over the square root of 4. The square root of 50 we can write as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. And the square root of 4 is just 2. And so our final answer will be the square root of 5, I'm sorry, not, uh, just 5 times the square root of 2 over 2. And here's our answer down here. So uh, sometimes finding the absolute value can take a little bit of work, especially when the expression that you are given is given as a quotient that you have to simplify. All right, the last topic that we're going to use complex numbers for is we're going to factor sums of squares. So uh, if I've got some expression like x squared plus 9, uh, this is a sum of squares, and we don't have a formula, or up until now we haven't had a formula, for how to factor this. If this were a difference of squares, we would know how. We know that uh, x squared minus 9 is equal to x plus 3 times x minus 3, and that's all very well and good, but x squared plus 9 we don't have. But we can do it using... Uh, complex numbers and using our symbol i by using this same formula. So we know how to factor a difference of squares and so our goal is to write down a sum of squares as a difference of squares using our symbol i, using the imaginary unit i. So let's do one example here and then we can write down what the general uh, technique is x squared plus 9, if I want to write that as a difference, I can. I can write that as x squared minus negative 1 times 9. Because well, adding something is the same as subtracting uh, the opposite of it. Now, what I can do is replace that negative 1 that I just introduced with i squared. So now, instead of negative 1, I can write 
i squared, and now my expression becomes x squared minus i squared times nine. And the reason why I like this is because now I can rewrite the term on the right in the following way. Nine is the same as three squared, and I can use the properties of exponents to write this as x squared minus i times three squared, or the more common way would be to write this as x squared minus three i squared. So uh, really I've just been rearranging things using our new symbol i. And all I've done is use the property that i squared is equal to negative one and that it i behaves with powers and products and everything just like any other variable or number would. But now notice that I have a difference of squares written down. Now I can use our difference of squares formula which says that if I have a squared minus b squared, that's equal to a plus b times a minus b. Here, so now my a term is x and my b term is 3i. So using difference of squares, x squared minus 3i squared is the same as x plus 3i times x minus 3i. And now we have successfully factored the original expression x squared plus 9 into uh, smaller, uh, lower degree polynomials. Now the price we paid for that is now our polynomials don't just have real number coefficients. We've got these complex number coefficients. We have the i's sitting here. But this technique can be used to factor any sum of squares that you like. And in fact, we can write it down as, a, as another formula in the same fashion of our difference of squares formula here. So now we have a sum of squares formula for factoring. If I have a squared plus b squared, that's always going to be equal to a plus b i times a minus b i. And that's just following exactly the same process that we did in the example just now. So now we do in fact have a sum of squares formula as well as a difference of squares formula. So let's take an example. Let's say I've got 36 y squared plus 81 z to the fourth x to the sixth. Well, as with difference of squares, a lot of times you want to start off by writing this explicitly as a sum of squares. So 36y squared is the same thing as 6y in parentheses squared. So uh, 36y squared is what you get when you multiply 6y by 6y. And I just got that by looking at each individual factor of 36y squared and saying, well, what's the square root of it? I can do the same thing over on the right. In order, uh, 81z to the fourth x to the sixth is a square, and we can look at each piece individually to see how that is. 81 is equal to 9 squared. z to the fourth is z squared squared because uh, two times two is four, and x to the sixth is x cubed squared, because two times three is six. So this expression, 36y squared plus 81z to the fourth x to the sixth is 6y squared, 6y parentheses squared plus 9z squared x cubed, all of that squared. So now we can use our sum of squares formula to factor this. This factors as 6y plus 9z squared x cubed i times 
6y minus 9z squared x cubed i. So the sum of squares formula, it exists. It's very, very similar to the difference of squares formula, but it involves i, the square root of negative 1, which sort of solves a whole bunch of problems that algebra has when working over the real numbers. So that's why we love uh, the imaginary unit i so much that some of the things that we do with it and we're going to continue to see how it's useful as we go on and solve even more problems.